Today's topic, eight simple asset protection moves for positions. One of my favorite topics. I could also tell you this is probably one of the favorite topics for physicians. They don't care about the cost. They just want to know how can I protect my assets? We've seen crazy things, but the goal of today's post is to not go crazy. Let's just see what can we do without doing attorney work or what can we do by just the coverage from our states? What is this coverage compared to this coverage? We're going to walk through eight simple tips some of them are going to be more simple than others. Regardless, these are going to be eight awesome ideas that you can think about implementing as a physician. Hopefully you already have a few of these covered. Ideally, by the end of it, you probably have all eight in place. Some states make it easier than others. I guess I shouldn't say all eight would be available to everyone because one of the big ones is only available in 18 states. So we'll walk through all eight of them together. I'll add in some tidbits from this real life experience. As always, stay tuned because that's coming up next. <music> My number one tip for asset protection. You're thinking medical malpractice, aren't you? It's not. This is my point. That's what we default to. It's protecting your marriage. You are much more likely to go through a divorce than you are to have a medical malpractice suit that goes against you. That's the key. Unfortunately, a lot of physicians will have the lawsuit side of a medical malpractice suit. They might not lose that or might not ever be above their medical malpractice limits, which again is the key point here of asset protection. But the easiest way to lose half your assets is to go through a divorce. So protect your marriage. Go on the date nights. If you're having a rough patch, go see the marriage counselor. Whatever you need to do to keep that fire going, keep it going. Hobbies, time to yourselves. My overused joke, if you think babysitters are expensive, wait till you see how expensive a divorce is. And I always start with this one because it's so simple, but yet it's often so I don't know if they've forgotten or if it's we just kind of looked over, but you couldn't ask for better asset protection than investing time and energy into your marriage with your spouse or your significant other to make sure that that fire not only burns bright, it continues to burn even brighter going forward. So my number one tip for asset protection as a physician is take time to spend in your marriage. Make sure that you keep that fire going. Go on those date nights, go on those vacations, time for the kids, the grandkids, whatever you need. First tip, invest in your marriage. All right, number two is malpractice insurance. I hope that this is not the first time you're hearing about the term called malpractice insurance. But really when I put the term invest in there, kind of misworded because for the bulk of the physician community, it's likely being provided through your employer, whether that's academic medicine or if you're in a private practice, likely a partners are kind of picking who they're going to use it. And that's the plane that you all are using. The certain circumstances where if you are maybe a solo practitioner, or maybe you have a policy where it didn't cover 1099 work, so you had to go get a separate policy for your moonlighting, your 1099 work, whatever the case would be, just don't forget about malpractice. Again, most of the time it's embedded in your employer, but check on the limits. Is it a one, three million for a million dollar per single event, three million dollar aggregate, which is most common a one slash three. That's usually how it looks. Can you add more to it? Does your current policy through your academic side cover you on 1099 work? All these little parts are vital, but the main takeaway here is when it refers to asset protection, just make sure it's in place. Make sure you understand your limits. Make sure it covers everything that you're doing. Number two is making sure that you have the proper malpractice insurance in place to protect you from the asset protection side. One of my favorite lines is, don't forget to take your umbrella on date nights. And what does this mean for asset protection, Chad? What are you talking about? Well, it covers my two easiest ways for asset protection. One, I referenced date nights. What did we talk about in number one here? Investing in your marriage, making sure that you're giving your relationship all the TLC that it needs because that's your number one asset protection tip. But number three down here is an umbrella policy. And umbrella policies are extremely easy to get. They're very low cost. I usually, this number can vary based on some things, but I usually say a million dollars of coverage is around $250 per year in premium cost. But it's called umbrella because it overlays your current liability on your home and your auto. And now this is personal liability. Umbrella policies have nothing to do with medical malpractice. This is if you're in a fender bender, they find out you're a physician, I call it my soccer flop, they roll around a lot more, they sue for 10 million even though their medical bills were only 10,000, whatever the example would be, you're just trying to add better protection in place there. And with Umbrella, always try to cover your net worth. If your net worth is not at a million yet, start at a million, as soon as your net worth goes above a million, round up to the next million, to the next million, to the next million. 
But number three, it's an easy one, but a vital one for asset protection is make sure that you have an umbrella insurance policy in place. Next up, prenups. I could even put in postnups here as well. I know it feels like a dirty word. I know that a lot of people don't even like to say this word, but the reality is it can be a really important tool for asset protection. And I think it also depends on where you came into the relationship. I use myself as an example. I married my high school sweetheart. When we came into marriage, we were both poor college kids for the most part. Heck, I had more student loan debt than she did. If anything, she should ask for the prenup, right? In that example, you're starting to grow together. But if you're coming into this a little bit later, because remember, physicians do get a little bit later start, and maybe you did start to build up some assets, and maybe you didn't have student loans, so it gave you a head start, but it's something to consider, right? And there's nothing wrong with having this conversation with your significant other, if we're referring to a post dump with your spouse in that example, but I at least want to put it on your radar. This is a good asset protection tool. And I know it's not the most exciting topic. It's also a tough topic to approach sometimes, but just keep in mind a good asset protection tool can be as simple as a good prenup or possibly if you're already married, even a post-nup in there. Again, putting it on your radar, depends where you came into it. There's a lot of movie parts here, but if we're going to get into the eight simple asset protection rules and things to at least keep on your radar, we can make a list without that. That needs to be on there. Number five, this is actually one of my favorites. This is a slam dunk asset protection tool. The problem is it only pertains to 18 states. And this is just a simple account title called tenants by the entirety. Two kickers here. It can only be with your spouse. That's hurdle number one. Hurdle number two is you need to live in one of the 18 states that allow it. In the actual video notes below, we'll have a link to the blog post. I have all 18 listed there. You also need to keep in mind there's seven states that allow it on real property, but not on assets. So for example, in those seven states, your home can be owned tenants by the entirety, which is also another very important tool to take advantage of, but you couldn't have your joint investment account be titled with that. And the amount of new clients that come to us and they live in one of those 18 states, but they still have their joint account listed as joint with survivorship amazes. Free asset protection, whether it's a single or dual physician household, that is an easy one for asset protection for the amount of times that we'll have someone come to us where they have this option, but they still have it as an individual account, then owned in the physician's name, even if the other spouse is a non-physician. So it's just this very simple account title. You can usually do it with just a letter of instruction, whether it's with a Fidelity or a Vanguard. But if you have not heard the term tenants by the entirety, look it up, see if you live in one of those 18 states, and then check on what the account title is on your current joint account, because most joint accounts default to joint with rights of survivorship, which is fantastic for estate planning. It's not going to do anything for you for asset protection. So tenants buy the entirety. Keep an eye out for it. Number six, focus on your retirement accounts for better protection. And what we mean by this is your 401k and your 403b are going to be protected by ERISA. Those are pretty much ironclad, meaning that even in a horribly gone wrong lawsuit, those assets are going to be protected. Now, here's the tricky part. That really only applies to your 401k, 403b, depending on your 457b. It's going to be covered on that side of it. Then you hit this middle of the road, which we label as IRAs and Roth IRAs. Here's where you'd really need to read the fine print because every state will be a little bit different. So read the fine print on what is covered there. Some states have great protections. Some have none in place. So you got to pay attention to that. And then even to the other side where some states will provide protection, some will, we get as specific as 529 plans and HSAs. So you need to understand how all these work. But if you had to default somewhere, you want to be in your retirement plans that are protected by ERISA. Even plug in the TSB here, the thrift savings plan, as I know there's a lot of VA positions out there that tune in as well. So main thing here is continuing to focus on those retirement accounts because you're going to get the protections from ERISA. Outside of those accounts, you do need to understand your state rules. And this is where tenants by the entirety comes in. This is where the homestead exemption comes in. This is where certain protections on livestock and do they cover a computer or a bed or a car or a boat those all come down to your state rules so the simplest way is whatever you can keep in your employer plans is likely going to have your best protection so again physicians love what's the easy asset protection most of the time it's going to be trying to keep as many assets as you can in the qualified plans because of ERISA. Number seven, leveraging trust. This is where it can start to get more complicated. Usually you are not getting to this point until you're probably seven figure club. It can vary because remember what I said earlier, with those states that allow tenants by the entirety, you probably have a much longer runway before it needs to get complicated. If you don't have that, 
may want to start kicking the tire sooner than later on possible irrevocable trust, which add a lot of layers to it. And you need to understand how it worked, which is why if you want to find a good attorney that you're walk walking through all these different steps. But some states allow something called a domestic asset protection trust or what we call a DAP. If your state does not allow that, sometimes you're looking towards something called a SLAT, a spousal lifetime access trust. There are a lot of different ways to go here. We even give a large return, which we call an asset protection trust, an APT. But really, I'd say the DAPs, the SLATs are probably the most common two that we're going to see. And the key is irrevocable. The amount of clients that have a living trust because their state has a horrid probate process, and that's what we call a revocable trust. Again, great for estate planning, does nothing for you in terms of asset protection. So I always note that because just because you have a living trust in place, land was a revocable trust, it doesn't mean you can start driving around like fast and furious and you stop taking your medical notes and all that. That's not going to do anything for you in terms of asset protection. So that's why leveraging the trust for number seven here, usually in the terms that we're referring to here, fires up a little bit later down the road. But for this traditional state planning, which is not the goal of this topic, you could have a living trust in place right away. Certain states sooner than later, and your wills or living wills or power of attorneys, things like that. But we'll save that topic for another day. But for number seven, asset protection, as things start to pick up in terms of size, leveraging trust could be a vital way to truly add in very secure and strong asset protection. But as any good estate attorney will tell you, there is no perfect solution. You're trying to put up as many barriers as you can so that the mouse cannot find the cheese. Number eight, LLCs and corporations. I like to call this by section LLC it. So whenever you have toxic assets, which sounds very bad, but in reality, these are probably cool things, right? It's probably a rental property. It's a snowmobile. It's a jet ski. It's an ATV. It's something that has extra risk that you want to separate from your personal assets. So for example, with rental properties, have your LLC own the rental property. So if something happens, if someone gets hurt there, it's all confined to that LLC, assuming that there wasn't just straight up negligence. But in that example, you're just trying to build it on its own little island there. And this can take many forms. We have some clients that'll have a few in one LLC. We'll have clients that have numerous rental properties and they each own their own LLC. This is where a good real estate or a good business attorney can really walk you through, but also understanding how your state works as well. Because again, it's going to come down to state details in a lot of these examples. But same thing with snowmobiles, jet skis, four wheelers, having those own in their own LLC so that heaven forbid someone ever would get hurt on those, it can't come back to your personal balance sheet. But another thing to keep in mind, if you are owning an LLC or if you set up an LLC for some of your 1099 income, keep in mind that a lot of states will require a second member. Meaning that if it's just you as a sole proprietor LLC, the state might come and say like, hey, listen, we get it, but we're not going to give you a traditional asset protection here because it was just you. It wasn't really being run as a dual member for a second member LLC. So again, comes down to states, but keep that in mind. See what your state's rules are on will they actually give you protection with a single member LLC? A lot of them will not. You'll need a second member on there to get the better asset protection. And sometimes it's simple just getting it set up as your own business entity, or maybe there's not an actual risk there from an asset protection perspective. Like a lot of times, if you have, you're doing telepsychiatry as an example, but you don't have a storefront, you set up an LLC just to have that own business entity, but you don't have someone coming in where you're worried about them maybe slipping and falling, coming in because you didn't put up the yellow sign, which is a lot of the, the liability that we're worried about in that example, because that's the business liability that wasn't medical malpractice. So also keep that in mind. Again, a good business attorney will walk you through this, but key thing for this section for the LLCs and corporations for number eight here is just if it has a risk to it, a greater risk, think about LLC in it. If you have a single member LLC, maybe look to add a second member in there if it's going to add better asset protection. But number eight with these LLCs and corporations are a really good way to add an extra layer of asset protection to your overall asset protection. And there you have it, eight asset protection rules for physicians. Like I said, some of those are a little bit more simpler than others, but all very good tidbits. Like I said, my favorite one is make sure you're taking an umbrella on your date nights, which references the two big ones in there and the idea of putting time and energy into your marriage to avoid a divorce. Umbrella insurance being the idea of adding an umbrella insurance policy. Tenants buy the entirety if your state allows it. We have that in there. We have the ERISA, putting more money into your retirement accounts. Sometimes it's as simple as just don't do a roll of don't take the money out of a 401k or fourth or being rolled into an IRA. Sometimes it's that simple because you have a better protection there on the ERISA side. But regardless, all eight of those, one of them has to pertain today. 
if not future planning as well. Those are eight great simple asset protection rules for you to keep an eye on, whether it's today or tomorrow. As always, thanks for tuning in for the last 15 minutes or so. If you have not subscribed, now would be a great time to do so. If you click a little bell icon, you'll get a notification every time we're releasing a new video or new content. We referenced the blog post as well. That'll be in the show notes. So anything that we reference that we can give you more context to, that'll be below in the show notes. Thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you in the next video.